Hello, everybody. It's your latest installment of the interview for the Pandemic Book Club. I am Tyler Kepner uh, from the New York Times, and I'm joined today by my buddy Jared Diamond from the Wall Street Journal, and more importantly, the author of Swing Kings. I know personally that Jared has been working really, really hard on this for, for a long time, and uh, I got to read it and enjoy it. It's, it's just fantastic. First of all, congratulations to you, Jared. I know what, uh, what a thrill this must be. Thank you. Yeah, this definitely wasn't the world I expected to release my first book into uh, during a global crisis, but we're making the best of it. And this is why we have this little club here. Right. And it's, it's a good time to read. I mean, you know, now it's like basically it's one of those things, right? If you can't read all the books on your, on your, uh, on your list now, you're, you're probably not going to. So now it's like a perfect time <laughs> to read everybody. So buy Jared's book. It's, it's, it's great because of a lot of reasons, but it's really on the, um, on the cutting edge of what's going on in, in the game right now you know what we see more home runs than ever fewer singles um you know more fly balls more guys trying to launch um and jared really uh, you found a, an idea that um was really at the heart of what's going on in baseball right now um let's tell me a little bit about the genesis of the idea um and sort of your own background as a, as a hitter who had one amazing day at the plate uh, as a kid and was always hoping to recapture it. So my interest in the story, I guess if you want to trace it all the way back, it traces back to my own uh, mediocre baseball career, uh, which peaked when I was, you know, ended when I was 18 years old and had one incredible day when I was about 15 years old. It was the best baseball day of my entire <laughs> life. Uh, when I got to the plate, it seemed like a perfectly normal day. I did nothing different the morning before. I didn't eat any special Wheaties or anything before the game. And yet somehow uh, the ball was just exploding off my bat, going to places that I never knew I was capable of hitting them to. This happened three times in one game, Consec three consecutive at bats, one bomb after the next. If you, anyone who saw me that day would have thought I really was going somewhere in baseball. Uh, <laughs> I probably thought so for about one night. Came right. back the next day uh, thinking this is the new me. I'm going to be a star now and of course uh, it did not happen uh, the next day I was <laughs> back to hitting ground balls to second base uh, and that was sort of the rest of my life and I always sort of thought about that day of, well what what did I do differently I obviously did something differently I was not doing the same thing but I had no idea what it was and it's sort of when I got into covering baseball my first season covering baseball in 2013 I first became really interested in trying to understand more about the swing and it started in a really weird way uh my first year covering the, the mets for the wall street journal 2013 had really never covered baseball before the mets that spring training or february signed marlon bird to a minor league contract which was the signing i completely ignored at the time <laughs> i'm not even sure i wrote when they signed him it was just a nothing signing 35 years old coming off a steroid suspension. <laughs> yeah, you even, me you even mentioned the headline, the, the rather underwhelming headline that you gave him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that wasn't even just about him. He was just in the yeah. group. It's of, in the group of, of uh, uninspiring right. outfielders. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember who was in it. I think Colin Cowgill was in it. Maybe yeah. Mike Baxter. It was, it was you know, no, nice guys, but... New and Heiss, yeah. No, no Mike Trouts were in, that, were in that group. So Marlon Bird is in spring training. He makes the team. And by early May, he's hitting cleanup. And by the end of the year, he's the Mets' best hitter. And that blew me away. I couldn't understand how this guy was doing this. And I would ask him over and over, like, what's going on? Like, what's the secret? What have you done? And he'd be very coy. Like, oh, I made some changes to my swing. Really didn't want to talk about it uh, until the Mets traded him away. They traded him to the Pirates. He helps the Pirates get to the playoffs. Uh, and then finally, he lets out this secret that he had worked that whole offseason with this guy named Doug Latta, this independent hitting instructor who was a swimming pool repairman who owns a batting cage in LA. And this guy taught him how to unlock the mysteries of the swing. And I thought that was completely insane, but that's what Marlon Bird said. Uh, and I kind of stored it away. And then as the years went on, we started hearing more stories like that. You know, JD Martinez has his big breakout and Justin Turner. For me, it sort of peaked when I realized there was really something here was in 2015 at the Home Run Derby when Josh Donaldson, then with the Blue Jays, has this guy named Bobby Tewksbury throwing to him, an independent hitting coach in New Hampshire. This guy is now pitching in the home run derby to Josh Donaldson. Yeah. And I realized there's a real story here that all of these players are having success with these seemingly random guys. 
Yeah, it's it's and and so many of them uh, really open up to you. Um, J.D. Martinez and Justin Turner and Chris Colavella, a lot of the players, and and especially a lot of the uh, a lot of these instructors. You know, a lot of guys who had little to no big league uh, or even professional uh, hitting experience, um, but they have been able to unlock some stuff that even the major league and uh, pro coaches uh, didn't or, or or were sort of ignoring. Um, and you trace it back to uh, Ted Williams's book, uh, that famous book that that um, you know that we all know about. But like one thing, I, I wonder, and you touch on it in the book, but explain to me here, like Ted Williams is the ultimate insider, right? He's the ultimate like the greatest hitter who ever lived, possibly. And he had all this written down 45 years ago, whenever that book came out. Um, how? Why did that not catch on? Was it? Was it the uh, well, he's a freak, and you can, no one can hit, only Ted Williams can hit like Ted Williams. Uh, you talk a lot about Charlie Lau being the, the popular guy, and that game was on AstroTurf, and it was a speed game. Like, Ed Williams himself, like, the, one of the most famous people ever to pick up a bat, was telling you how this was done, and, and coaches didn't like it. Yeah, the science of hitting actually turns 50 this year. It came out in 1970 okay. is when it first came out. It was Ted Williams, the manager at the time, just starting his sort of failed – managerial career it wasn't a great managerial right. career with right. the senators and rangers uh it's very strange that that did not catch on it did with some people there's right. for some that book is the bible but in the mainstream it wasn't and i think there's a few reasons why i think the he's a freak syndrome was part of it this idea that oh that's what you do but you, you're ted williams you you have this crazy eyesight and <laughs> normal people can't do that which Saying that out loud is so insane because what other industry would you not model yourself after the best? Right, like as right. a writer, you're not going to read just like some fourth grade essay to figure out how you should write your stories. You're yeah. going to read the best writers of all time and sort of model, try to model yourself off their voices. That's what right. anyone would do in any industry. But in baseball, it wasn't that. I think Ted Williams' personality probably played a role into it. He was right. very aggressive. He was very gruff. He was not exactly like a soft and fuzzy teacher, and he probably wasn't a very good teacher at all. Uh, I talked to some people who played for him when he was a manager, mm -hmm. and the one thing several of them said, and I think at least one of them's in the book, says like, yeah, he would just tell us, do what I do. Right, right, right. And they would say, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, Mike Epstein, me right? how to do Yeah, Mike Epstein's in the book yeah. talking about, yeah, Ted Williams, when he was our manager, he would just grab a bat and say, here's how it's done, boys. Right, right, right. Well, let's do this. I can do it. Look how easy it is. I'm, you know, right. 60 years old and I can hit bombs. Right. Uh, it doesn't work like that for yeah. normal people. Teaching and playing are not the same skills. Right. Uh, and I think finally major teams are realizing that, that just because you were a great player or even a player at all, doesn't mean you have the skills to be a good teacher. Like, I, it's so crazy what the qualifications were to be a major league hitting or pitching coach were for most of baseball history. It was basically two things. You played Major League Baseball and you were friends with the manager. That was basically the criteria. It was just like, you're cool. I like you. We work well together. You played ball. Like, want to be the hitting coach? Yep. And there wasn't much thought beyond that. And finally, teams have started to realize, like, hey, there's a real art and science to teaching. And it's not the same skill as playing. And maybe we should try to optimize that. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at this quote here from Andy Haynes. Um, the hitting coach for the Brewers, who um, who really nails it in this quote, and I've come to notice this too in dealing with play, contemporary players. Uh, he says, today's players don't care about your background. They don't even ask you. They just want to know if you can help them or not. And and that, it, logically, that does make sense. Like, you know, if, if you get a Hall of, if you get Ted Williams, okay, you're going to listen to him. But if he can't help you, then it's sort of like, well, Functionally, what, is that, what does that mean? But if you get some guy who really can understand you and breaks down stuff in a way that connects with you and that you start seeing results, then that's your guy. You know, even if he never played pro ball, if he was a failed hitter. Um, so I thought, I, I see that too, and you really pick up on that by talking to so many of these guys and going to their hitting cages and going to their oftentimes pretty rudimentary setups um, where these, these players really – learn their craft it's funny though because i see some of these guys on twitter and there's still so much um i don't know if it's 
I don't know if it's widespread or just a few loud voices, but but there's always these this, this little patch of ex-players who are <laughs> you know, ripping these these guys for not having uh, any any playing experience or or limited playing. You know, like oh, I hit 290 and you hit 180 or it's something. It's been like real that. loud just lately. It's been real loud. Yes, right. That's just the last couple of weeks, it's right. gotten louder. So, so what is that? Are these are these other guys? Are they just defensive because they had careers and it worked for them, and they don't? I mean, don't take me into some of that phenomenon because you know all these these new gurus yeah. better than anybody now. Uh, like I, I don't think you could ever dismiss anyone's experience who made it to the major leagues. Like right. one of the loud voices is like Kevin Euclid is very loud about this. Jeff Fry has been the recent sort yes. of Twitter king of just ripping on everyone who didn't play major league baseball all day long every day all day long i know and he's a lot of time on his hands because we're all inside mm-hmm. so he's just on twitter all day uh, you can't dismiss their experiences those guys made the major leagues like whatever they did oh worked. yeah can't argue it and a good coach would never argue that like a good hitting coach would never dismiss the perspective of mm-hmm. a jeff fry uh, the problem is there are a lot of sort of self-styled hitting gurus that you see on the internet. And I know this because I've heard from all of them mm-hmm. in the last two years. Uh, when, when word that I was working on this book sort of started getting out there, right. it's amazing how many people I heard from came out of the woodwork, like right about me, like right. I'm doing this and that. Uh, and so I kind of understand like why some major league players wouldn't distinguish, ex players wouldn't distinguish between all these voices. Like they just see these guys that didn't play use, doing weird drills or, using technology that they either don't understand or never had when they were playing. And they just sort of lump them all together as mm-hmm. uh, this weird new age group. And honestly, there's probably some coaches that lump all X players in as sort of dinosaurs, which right. also isn't fair or true. Right. One of the challenges of the book was like trying to figure out who really uh, knows what he's talking about and who's a fraud. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was hard. I'm not even necessarily sure I figured it out. Uh, well, yeah, I was, I was going to ask you that. Because, like, when I'm watching games, you know, on TV or the press box, I think I have a little more insight into pitching, having written a book about it. But I'm still, you know, I'm not, I can't with a naked eye discern most mechanical things. Um, but I can get a little closer to it with pitching than hitting. When I see a hitter, most of the time, that, that happens so quickly from a from the ball to the pitcher's hand to come to the plate so fast like all these little movements <laughs> that it takes to get from here to there and hit the ball i can't see it um i it just like almost looks like a swing to swing now if i break it down or if they do the side by side where you see a guy having a leg kick one year and not the other year then you can see it but can you when you're watching these games on tv or in the ballpark um can you in real time see these mechanics being put into place not in live speed. It's just yeah. too fast. And right. also, I'm not qualified to write a hitting manual. Yeah. Uh, like, I could never explain to you how to be a better hitter. So if you want to know how to be a better, don't ask me. Ask right. the guys in the book. They could tell right, you. Right. I, I can't. But I think I'm, when I really slow it down, now I have a better sense of, like, what makes a swing good and what doesn't. But with the naked eye, it's like, yeah, it happens so incredibly fast and honestly i don't even think most coaches necessarily could see it with the naked eye like that's why these tools exist that's yeah. what makes ted williams so amazing that he did right. know just sort of intuitively what right. to do most people like need to go back and look at video and see what you were doing because one thing i have definitely learned from doing the book is that hitters most hitters a lot of hitters don't actually know what they do or what yeah. they think they do is not what their body is doing or their mental cues is not what their body's doing. How many times have we heard A-Rod on Sunday Night Baseball say, I just tried to swing down and hit the top of the ball and like work back up the middle? Right. Like, no, you didn't. You may right. think that like you truly thought that's what you were doing and that mental cue worked for you. So that therefore you were right, right? Mm-hmm. Like never change that thought because it made you hit 6,000 million home runs. Like it worked. Right. But, but that's not what you were doing <laughs> at all. Like yeah. he was hitting the bottom of the ball and he was like working up. And that was such a weird thing to think about and for so many of these coaches that was like the real epiphany moment Mm -hmm. when they were looking at video and going to their hitters and saying like why are you doing this with your elbow or this with your shoulder and hitters would say i'm not Mm -hmm. that's when i think a lot of the coaches realized like okay new policy like we're not talking about what you think you do we're just going to look at the tape and figure it out what you're actually doing because there's a huge disconnect in like what your mind thinks and what your body does Right. Well, that's why it was fascinating the way, you know, some of these hitters were so 
um, so first of all, so athletic enough to get to the big leagues with with bad swing, um, you know, like Justin Turner, uh, J.D. Martinez, you know, guys who had real flaws in their swings, but they were still good enough to make the big leagues. I mean, that's amazing. But they also, once they got there, had the had the courage to try something new and the ability to see it. That idea of of uh, J.D. Martinez seeing that Jason Castro was hitting better than he thought Jason Castro could. And then seeing Ryan Braun on the TV and taking that. That's one of the things I, I liked about my book is, is, is just tracing pitches through the years, through the generations. And you did it too in the sense of like, you know, Joe, Joe Borcher to Cord Phelps to Jason Castro, you know, some, some Stanford guys there to a teammate of Jason Castro's with J.D. Martinez, you know, and how this, this progression without anyone in that chain, J.D. Martinez may not, <laughs> may not be who he is. So, like, in, 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 I guess the question would be, like, in, in researching this book, how much did you have in tracing the lineage of some of this stuff? And how much sort of um, you come to admire these hitters who were able to transform themselves, even if they already had a, some semblance of a big league career? Yeah, it was crazy because when I started, I didn't know about any of these chains. I just thought I'm going to write the story of J.D. Martinez. And then he mentions Castro. And then, be, okay, well, let's call Jason Castro. Right. And then he says, well, I heard about – this independent hitting coach from this guy. Mm -hmm. Let's call that guy. And you keep tracing it back and suddenly you're on the phone with players from 25 years ago yeah. who have these incredible, incredible stories. And what's so amazing, I think what I really came to appreciate is like how amazing you have to be to make it to the major leagues in terms of what you had to be born with. Like mm -hmm. J.D. Martinez had a terrible swing. And that you could see with the naked eye. Go watch J.D. Martinez when he first came up to the major leagues. That thing was a mess. Yeah, had all these weird movements and it was so clunky. Like even I could tell this is awkward and he still makes the major leagues by like sheer force of will, by athletic ability, reflexes, things that you had to be given by God. No, right. you had to be born with this. And he just made it work somehow to the getting to the major leagues. And then there was this common thread that all these guys reached the JD Martinez, the Justin Turner's, all of them, they reached this point of desperation. I think it's so powerful when mm -hmm. you realize this isn't working anymore and my career is about to be over. And suddenly the idea of going to work with a swimming pool repairman or whatever, <laughs> any of these guys' crazy backgrounds, well, you know what? What I'm doing is not working. I'm going to be out. So what do I have to lose but to try? And when you're a great athlete, what's amazing is what your body can do when you put your mind to making a change. Like if you or I tried to change a lifetime of mechanics in one off season, we would fail because our bodies aren't made to make those big changes, but a pro athlete, they can almost like will their bodies into different muscle memory just because they have that athleticism. So I could not become a great hitter just by working with these hitting coaches. And trust me, I tried. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I tried as hard as I could. It's just this combination of genes and technique. It shows when you have the right technique, what you could do because JD Martinez in 2013, and J.D. Martinez in 2014 and beyond, two very different players. Right, right. And the Astros, a very smart organization, still didn't, didn't uh, keep him around. Um, I would have said know. that was their biggest mistake, but a yeah. lot has changed since then. Right, right, <laughs> right. their well, second well, biggest mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the second biggest mistake. Right. Well, and you talk about how the pitching was so far ahead of hitting in terms of using technology um, to you – know, make improvements and now the hitting is, is catching up and how the Dodgers were on the front end of that and all that's very fascinating. I want to give it all away because you, you, everybody who's listening should, should read the book but what do you think in a broader picture that this is, is doing to the game? It, it, it's a smarter I think I think it's a smarter approach um, certainly a more logical approach there's more hits in the air there's more slug in the air um, the batting average when you get the ball in the air compared to the ground is, is everything's better when you put the ball in the air um, but you talk about some of the offshoots of that, which is more strikeouts and the pitchers are better. Anyway, where are we headed in this game? Cause I watch a game from the eighties and I'm partial cause I was growing up then, but like, yeah, the, the running game is so much more of, of a thing. Um, you know, there's not as many home runs, but there are still some home run hitters. The game moves a little quicker. Um, how, where are we headed for this? And is it good for the overall game? Yeah, it's, it's to me, this, that is the biggest question. All of this is the biggest question I think baseball faces sort of existentially in the long term. And that question is, what is the best aesthetic product for baseball? Because right. the game is clearly smarter 
it's more optimized every day, but just because you're smart doesn't mean it's better. And there's no doubt that it's smarter. This approach of trying to hit the ball in the air as opposed to the ground, it works. It's irrefutable. Since 2015, major league hitters have hit 247 with a 269 slugging percentage on balls on the ground. And on balls in the air, the batting average is 406, and the slugging percentage is 787. You said Williams, 406, 700. Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> you can't, it's, it's, it's irrefutable. You just cannot argue that it's better in terms of smarter or it's more successful and makes you win more games, but is it a better product? You know, it's so funny because we watch games, like you said, from the 70s and 80s. I didn't get to see them live, but I've seen them uh, on replays and whatnot. And it's so interesting to me what's so different about the game. A lot of things are different, but the thing that always stands out to me is how much faster the game moves. Yeah. In part because guys are swinging the bat. Like, they, they're looking to put the ball in play, like, actively. Mm-hmm. So the ad bats are like three pitches long. They're like, okay, that one's way off the plate. I'll take that. All right, this one's close. Let's just yeah. like hit this ball. I'm going to put it in play. And they did. Now it's like, no, you got to wait for that one that's right down the middle so you could absolutely crush it. And if you strike out, so be it. Um, right. Look, there's probably some middle ground between those two approaches. Like it probably wasn't wise for hitters in the 70s to swing at pitches on the outside corner. They had no chance of hitting well mm-hmm. just to put them in play. Uh, it's also probably not good for the product for there to be 5 billion strikeouts uh, Mm -hmm. over the course of the season. I mean, it's not the all or nothing game. Like I'm sure there's some people that like it, but I think there's more that probably think it's too slow or there's too much lag time, like a lot of nothing. And then the big burst of energy, especially because home runs reach their status in sports in part because of rarity. So when they become less rare, they no longer are quite as exciting. So this is like a big, it's a big issue. I don't know how it's solved. I think it eventually requires actual intervention mm-hmm. by the powers that be because teams are never going to uh, sort of do anything that, has, that doesn't just make them win more games. That's the only thing they care about. Right. And it's all they should care about. Like I don't, if you're a general manager of a baseball team, your job's to win. It's not to put like a fun product on the field. That's the job of Rob Manfred and his people to figure out what a fun entertaining product is knowing by the way that these gms as smart as they all are they'll work within any framework you give them right mm-hmm. like you set the parameters and they'll still try to game it right. but they'll just work with well again except for the astros <laughs> we'll work within the parameters that are are set so i don't know what the answer is rob manfred's been still somewhat reluctant to make like big changes he's tried to solve some of these problems by making changes on the edges Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the three batter rule, which, you know, will have an effect, but probably not an enormous one. The mm-hmm. question is, are they willing to really try some really radical things? You know, we heard about an independently trying, maybe trying to like move the mound back six inches. Right, right. Then what they would that do for the, they, they scrapped it, but yeah. frankly, like I, I was, was kind of curious what was going to happen if they did it. Yeah. I don't know what would have happened. I have no clue, but I was like kind of interested just yeah. to like see what would happen. What would happen if guys couldn't throw 100 anymore? You know? Right. So how, I'm not saying it would be good, but I'm also I'm open-minded mm-hmm. to trying things because baseball clearly was not built for everyone throwing 100. It just right. wasn't. Like the game was not designed for the pitching to be this good. It's also why I get so annoyed when people blame the hitters for all the strikeouts. It's like, it's all these launch angle swings. Like, no, to me, yeah. it's not. The reason there's so many strikeouts, first and foremost, is have you seen what's happening in pitching? Right. You have, clearly. Yeah. Um, Pretty good everyone, now. <laughs> everyone throws 100. Right. Uh, you never, ever face a tired pitcher, ever. Yeah. You, every pitcher you face is perfectly optimized to get you out. Mm-hmm. Uh, these sliders and breaking pitches appear to disobey the laws of physics. They move mm-hmm. in ways that they never supposed to move before. And oh, by the way, we have completely gained where we put our fielders. Yeah. That even if you do put the ball in play and hit it hard, someone will probably just be standing there. You want to try to get three hits in an inning to score a run off of that? You're not going to. The way you score is to hit home runs. Because if you rely on four hits coming in one inning, you Mm -hmm. won't do it. You have to do it in one swing. So uh, until you somehow incentivize or make it so that you could score more easily without relying on the home run, teams have no choice but to take this approach. And that's why there's so many strikeouts because you try going up there to hitting these guys. Like yeah. the whole Twitter account called Pitching Ninja that right. just is revolves around showing how unhittable these pitches are. <laughs> right, right. Every hit's like a miracle. I still don't know how guys do yeah, it. I don't know how anyone ever hits 300. It's yeah. amazing. 
But do you have a better appreciation now that because a lot of your, your research was interactive, you know, getting to actually hit with uh, Dukesbury and Latta and some of these guys um, and, and, and see firsthand their, their instruction. Um, what, what, did, what did that ask, what did that technique um, of reporting uh, do for your understanding of the game and how much do you think it helped the book? It was a lot of fun. <laughs> but I, I feel like I did a couple flyouts in the media game. Right? I feel like I did it mostly just for my own fun, and if it helped yeah. the book, great. I just wanted to get get in the cage. Yeah. Uh, so it was interesting. One thing it really showed was actually how much progress you actually could make in a short time. Even mm -hmm. me, my first swing in the batting cage with Bobby Tewksbury uh, in New Hampshire was about sixty mile an hour exit velocity, or roughly yeah, yeah. sixty. Uh, by the end of our session, which was like a couple of hours, I was up around close to 80. Yeah, that was in one day. Right. For green, you're, like, you're not making the major leagues with 80. Uh, but that's pretty good for one day. So imagine yeah. what you can do if you're already capable of hitting 100. And I, like, right. J.D. Martinez hit major league home runs. Like, he hit balls as hard as one could physically hit them with his terrible swing. Mm -hmm. Now imagine what happens when you like, really give him the technique. If I could do it, imagine what a big league could do, could do. That's what it really like showed me how guys like Justin Turner did this. It's like yeah. if I could make this little progress in one day, you know what you could do if you're there for every day for months at a time, like you could become a star. And like yeah. I don't think I could have become a star, but I honestly think if I had kept going, if I could have spent three months every day, five days a week with Bobby Tewksbury, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a ceiling, mm -hmm. but I I really think I could have made like amazing more progress. Like would have found your ceiling. Yeah. You would, yeah. you would have maximized what you could do. Right. right. And I think it probably like was the case with a lot of these guys. I really believe that my ceiling was probably higher than is still probably higher than I could imagine. Again, I'm not making the major leagues, but it's probably better than I could have fathomed for myself. And you know how I know that? Cause I did it one day. Yeah. When I was 15 right. years old. That was the ceiling. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't. Who knows? Maybe yeah. there's something beyond that. But like, yeah. the fact of the matter is, it's out. There. It's there. It's it's in there. Uh, yeah. You just need the right concoction of coaching. And like, it would have been fun to like really immerse myself and spend like a month doing it every day and to see what it happens. You know. Right. Right. Well, you've obviously chosen a good career path, uh, and, and and you're you're really a. Uh, put it together in this book. I'll just, we'll wrap it up with just a couple of questions because we're a couple of writers talking. Um, tell me a, a little bit about like, was there anyone that you were chasing in this book who you had a moment where you finally got them? Like you, you finally, you know, all your effort to reach this guy paid off in a big way or someone you had, like for me, it was Roy Halladay a couple of years. I, I like, you know, I tried to get him, it, it didn't get him. And then one day in the third year of doing research, I finally got him. And then obviously wow. it turned out to be incredibly uh, lucky that I did get him when I did but um, you know that was like three years of pacing and I finally got this guy like was there someone who was a white whale that you finally reeled in late yeah so I didn't have three years I only had 18 months so I was on a yeah. pretty compressed timeline there's a few guys I was chasing uh, there was a couple that I figured out really quickly were not going to talk Aaron Judge was mm -hmm. the big one on that I don't want to get into why Aaron Judge wouldn't talk because it's an mm -hmm. interesting sort of subplot yeah, of the book. Uh, it's the Aaron Judge part of the book is it's really weird. <laughs> it's like really so the DVD extras, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> really weird. Directors, like his that, his whole deal. But yeah. the but the big one was JD Martinez. So yeah. I approached JD Martinez in spring training of 2018. It was the first. It was a month after I sold the book. Mm -hmm. well, I'm doing this book. You're a huge part of it. He was like, Yeah, yeah. I will talk to you. I'm like, When? He's like, I don't know. How about mm -hmm. right now? Like, no, too busy. How mm -hmm. about later this spring? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so of course we didn't talk that spring. Every single time I saw him, whether I was in Boston or the Red Sox were in town or wherever, I'd be like, so we doing that thing? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll do it. Saw him at the All-Star game. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it. I wasn't sure if he actually remembered me every single time or if he just pretended he was remembering it. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I still don't really know for sure. It's like every time you see him, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you're that guy. Uh, this went all the way through the World Series because the Red Sox won the World Series. Literally on the field after they won the World Series, I'm like, okay, you just won the World Series. Right. We're doing it. It's like, yeah, yeah okay. Right. Never knew it was going to happen. Um, so it's now like mid-November. The book is due in June. Uh -huh. I was already now resigned to like maybe not be able to actually get fresh quotes from JD. I'm like getting older quotes. 
from the clips, you know, it would have been fine, you know, it would have been okay. But it wouldn't have been great. And then I literally like just got a call. <laughs> and yeah. it was like it was JD Marnie. He's like, okay, I'm ready to talk now. I was wow. sitting in the right. office at the Wall yeah, Street. Where were you? I was in the journal office, like I don't know what I was doing. Yeah. Not like a random I think Robert Van Skoyak, the Dodgers hitting coach, may yeah. have texted me or called me like before being like I'm trying to get him to call you. And nudge him along. Yeah. yeah, like he like he says he'll do it. And then it's like he just called out of the blue. I'm like, he's like, okay, I'm ready to talk right now. Yeah. <laughs> right now? I'm like, yeah, right now. I'm like, right. This okay. is your shot right here. Yeah. yeah. So he ended up giving me like an hour though, which was amazing. And uh it was totally I'm so happy it happened because, you know, his stuff was amazing and he had a lot of anecdotes that others had not told about his story he it was funny the interview was really funny because he starts telling the story and it was like i could tell it's like he's told this story before and he's kind of like going through the motions right right and then i'm just like yeah i know all of this all right and i'm like if i know way more than what you're telling i start of telling him about the stuff i had heard from all the people around him yeah and he goes oh so you want the real story he, right and i'm like yeah i want yeah. every excruciating detail i think he was kind of like maybe a little impressed that I already knew a lot that he had, was yeah. not used to talking about. Right. So that's where he's like, let me start again at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he <laughs> was then, great. He gave you the, the intro to the book. It really, really he jumped. He was away. really great. And it was just so funny when the phone rang, it was JD Martinez. Right. And he was like talking to him is crazy because he's like very all over the place. Like there were clearly like, people in the house and he's like talking to them and like screaming at them. There's like noise <laughs> in the back. I don't know what he was doing. Yeah. But uh, it was a not a very like easy interview because like I felt like I was fighting with whoever else was like in his home yeah. at that moment. But it was totally worth it, and I it was yeah uh, I, I I saw him since, and I'm still only like sixty percent sure he like remembers it. Like I don't yeah, know, I know the feel. you know like right right. <laughs> But now he's, he's 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 on the cover of a book that's in bookstores everywhere, you know. So he he should he should know you now. He should, I think he, he I think he does, but I'm not. Yeah. He's like, oh yeah, you you're the book guy, you know. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 lastly, how did you in in that 18 month time frame? How did you and well, tell me, did you write it during the season as well as doing your, you know, going out to ballparks and doing your daily stuff? Because for me, I can only. I can only really write book stuff um, in an off-season setting, like when I'm not writing, um, when I'm not going to the ballpark uh, sort of thing. Were you able to, like, how did you separate, like, the 2018 season paradigm and versus, like, writing a whole scope of, of – because uh, the book writing's different, you know. Like, how did, how did you do the two at once, or did I you? Got, I got – I, I kind of did. I didn't have time not to. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of got good at – writing at weird times mm. in like weird places like I wrote a ton of the book or at least like early snippets of the book just chunks here and there first things first I didn't think about writing it as a whole book at first I completely just said okay this is what I have I'm just gonna write this yeah. and I don't really know exactly where this is gonna fit in the book or how it's gonna connect but I'm just gonna get it on the page yeah. what I essentially did is I narrowed once I narrowed down that I was going to write about four main hitting coaches and mm -hmm. each of whom have one or two main pupils. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to think about this as four separate stories. Like mm -hmm. I had four like separate docs of like all of just, this is my Craig Wallenbrock area and this is my Doug Latta area. I'm just going to write their stories out as if it were a long magazine story. Just mm -hmm. get it on the page. I'll figure it out later how it all goes. And I got really good at writing. Um, I wrote a lot like during the 2018 playoffs, like on planes and like I get to the ballpark really early before anything happens and just like spend that first hour before I go down to the field is like writing a thousand words. Um, just like at weirdo times. So I had to, I didn't have any time. I had 18 yeah. months from selling the book to submitting the first draft and I didn't have any reporting when I sold the book. Yeah. I knew some of the characters and I had met them before, but I hadn't like interviewed them. So it was kind of just as I went and then the 2018 19 off season, I just like went crazy, you know, <laughs> like I just right. did nothing else. But I did, I did sort of write as I went because I didn't really feel like I had time to like do all the reporting and mm -hmm. then all the writing. I kind of had to do it concurrently and something like that led on different directions. Like, I'm sure if I looked at my proposal for the book and yeah. the actual book, they probably are nothing alike at this point. 
Like yeah. they totally went down an avenue they never expected. I didn't even know Aaron Judge was going to be part of this book when I sold it. Really? He hadn't outed himself as someone who had worked as an independent hitting coach. Yeah, he had to go get the teacher man in St. Louis. And, you know what? It's funny. That's actually a funny story. The, I had written the whole proposal. We had submitted the proposal. We, had, we were going for our meetings with publishers. And the night before those meetings, when Aaron Judge tweeted about his... Wow. So I had a quick regroup. I'm like, with my agent, we're like, we have to talk about Aaron Judge in this meeting. Like, yeah. it's not on the proposal, like value add with the publishers. Like, got Aaron Judge. Yeah. Not knowing if he would ever, like, I'd be able to even talk about him in the book, which I did. But right. uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a crazy process. But it was, it was a whirlwind. Like, I kind of wish I had more time. Uh -huh. But I, I hope it doesn't come off like I need more time. <laughs> no, no, you, you, really, uh, you really nailed it. How many, how many words was it? It was, the draft I submitted was about 105, but I knew we were going to cut it down to more like 90 to 95. Okay. I think it ended at maybe somewhere in that 90 to 95 range, like 92, yeah. 93. I, I just decided I was going to file everything. At some point, you probably know this, mm -hmm. I, I was no longer could figure out what, like was extraneous and what was good right. like i just like i had lost all perspective i'm like right. is this good i don't know you know what my editor's smart he hasn't seen yeah. any of this yet <laughs> you tell me what needs to be cut out of this and i will just trust your judgment yeah yeah well it's uh it's really something to be proud of it is uh swing kings and i would really encourage you all to go get it like i mentioned i'm a pitching guy but obviously hitting uh is uh, the other oh they make a good game. double feature Right. Yeah. I need to make um, movies. I'll make a good like uh, I'll make a good double feature one day. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, when I found you were writing a book, I was just glad it wasn't on pitching. You know, so we 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 sort of have both sides of of uh, of the things covered there. Um, but anyway, you did a great job. You should be really proud. It's it, obviously the timing's rough, but um, I hope you enjoy everything you have coming to you with it. Um, go out Hopefully and buy. We it. have a baseball season. Yeah, I know. It's it's. Uh, you know, it, this is a perfect kind of to hunker down with a good book and it's a fun read. It's about, it's, you're right, because you said something earlier, you're like, you are not qualified to tell you how to hit. I'm not qualified to tell anybody how to pitch, right? But what I can do is tell the stories behind the guys who know how to do it. And that's what you, that's what you did. That's what you're good at, um, is telling people's stories, the human side of what goes into making yourself into a better hitter. Um, so if you wanna, you wanna learn how to be a hitter, uh, you know, go to a coach or buy an instruction manual, but this is the story behind how these guys do it. So you did a great job. Thank and, you. Um, thank you. I hope else? people uh, could check it out. I know these are tough times and not everyone's in the position to run out and spend $25 on a book. But for those who are, you know, I support your local bookstores. They need it mm -hmm. badly right now. Like these are all just another small business struggling in this time. Yeah. And uh, we all miss baseball. So hopefully it's a little taste of the, of that game we're like craving desperately or at least i, I know i know all the rhythms are thrown off it's april and there's no baseball here so i weird. know we don't know if there's gonna be that's the crazy part like i know that's the like every thing. day i i feel worse about it not better that's the that's the sad part i'm keeping my fingers crossed that we get some 2020 season at some point yeah i know i'm with you man i'm with you um good luck with it and um again congratulations thanks so i just like i just like that the new york Times and wall street journal could get along that's right. That's right. We can uh, come together over, over this thing right here. <laughs> over so, Exactly. Well, thanks yeah. so much for doing this. I appreciate it. All right. Of course. Uh, and, uh, join us again for the next installment of uh, Pandemic Book Club. This is Tyler Kepner with Jared Diamond. Thanks for joining us.